Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. As you can see, I'm back here in Toronto with a few souvenirs from my trip to London. Probably my favorite video I've ever made is Vancouver by train. There's something so awesome about being able to ride around a city from above, looking out the front window and seeing how the rail and transit system actually works. That's why when I got to London, I knew I had to get back out onto the DLR network which I've talked about a fair bit on this channel, and then ride around, as well as tell you about some of the development and this incredible transit system that serves Eastern London. If you enjoy this video, consider supporting me by joining my Patreon or subscribing to my Substack. And if you want to catch all of my future videos, make sure you're subscribed down below and you hit the bell icon. The DLR is a really interesting transit network. And I say network because it truly operates like a network rather than a collection of lines like some other metro systems. The core of the network is a section of track roughly between Canning Town and Canary Wharf in London's Docklands. Both of those stations being transfer points for the Jubilee Line extension, and Canary Wharf being London's second financial district, which developed back in the late 20th century. From here, routes shoot out in every different direction. Let's start today's video with a trip from Lewisham up to Bank in the City of London, the city's traditional financial district, via Canary Wharf, the city's new financial district. As you can see here, sitting at the platform at Lewisham, the DLR operates with third rail, specifically with bottom contact third rail, which makes accidental strikes and buildup of ice or other debris less likely. You can also see this arrow pointing off to the right. This is a points indicator that shows the status of the switch, which can be a bit hard to see otherwise. Since, like most trains in the UK, the DLR operates on the wrong side of the track, okay, the left, the points need to switch before we depart, and as you can see by the indicator, they do. I also want to point out the transit-oriented development off to the right. The amount of TOD around the Docklands and the River Thames in East London is truly incredible. As we head towards our first station, an announcement is made mentioning that some doors will not open. To a right, please move towards the center of the train, as the first two sets and last two sets of doors will not open. Indeed, to save cost, or to avoid a very difficult retrofit, you could have stations which are shorter than your train, and selectively open doors, even on a metro-style network. That's known as selective door operation, and it happens all over the place in London, including on the tube. You can also see tap points as we pull into the station. Unlike most rail services in London, DLR stations are proof of payment, the honor system. You tap in and out to pay your fare, but there are generally no gates. As we leave Elverson Road, we can see another DLR train operating in the other direction. The DLR rolling stock is quite unusual. It's based on a similar German Stadtbahn as Kaifler articulated train design that you see in North American light rail systems, with each car being composed of two sections with two doors each and three bogies, just like the C train in Calgary. The only difference here is that the trains use third rail and are automated. Leaving the station, we can also see a transition back to ballasted track, which a decent part of the DLR runs on, reusing old railway rights of way in many cases. We come to a section of track with guardrails, which help keep the train on the tracks, and a split in the rails that looks like this. This is a thermal expansion joint, which lets the rails grow and shrink without buckling in the heat. As you can see, this section of the DLR runs elevated, weaving between various high-density transit-oriented developments. We pull into Greenwich, as in Greenwich Mean Time, and you can see there's also adjacent mainline rail tracks which you can make a cross-platform transfer to. It's maybe not in the direction most people want to go, but it's better than nothing, and much appreciated for the few transfers in that direction. We've also got this big mirror here that can be used by an operator when necessary to ensure the platform is clear before closing the doors. An operator actually did run this train from the front of the train for the first part of the journey because of CCTV issues, and it was completely seamless. 
As we head into the tunnel under the Thames, you can see the tunnel was created by a tunnel boring machine, thanks to the circular appearance and the interlocked rings. The third rail also switches sides from the emergency exit walkway. Generally, the third rail is placed further from where passengers could be, including the side opposite the platforms in stations when possible. Pulling into Cuddy Sark, we can once again hear an announcement about a short platform. Being able to extend only simpler above ground stations when you need to grow capacity can be one of those benefits related to selective door operation. Within the station, you can also see the basic but nice next train screen, which gives you the time until the next train as well as its destinations. Useful given the DLR runs so many different services. You can also see the platform edges are done differently than in North America and some other places, with the tactile strip placed further back onto the platform and a more distinctive yellow line. Looking to the left of the tunnel here, you'll notice some video screens, which have the same role as the mirror we saw before, but help because they're less easily blocked and also can work around corners or curved platforms. Pulling into Island Gardens, you can once again see just how simple even a below grade station on the DLR is. As we pop out of the tunnel, the Canary Wharf skyline, which is increasingly residential, comes into view. We also switch back over to Ballast as we enter Mudshoot Station. As you can see, there's a third platform here off to the side, which allows the service to run here and terminate without blocking the mainline. Leaving the station, you can see one of the many double crossovers on the system. These are generally unusually short and tight owing to the very sharp corners the light rail derived rolling stock can take. While a similar double crossover on the Vancouver Skytrain can handle some third rail in the middle, the ones on the DLR rely on the cars outside of it to receive power and push or pull the rest of the train through, as well as, well, momentum. You might be wondering what the wire you see running down the middle of the track is. This is actually the loop for the signaling system, which is the same cell track system used on the Skytrain. Heading into Cross Harbor Station, we pass another pocket track, which can be used to store trains or turn a service in either direction. Passing through the station, we're up above the ground once again, passing through a forest of high-rise towers and we pass over a dock, reminding us why this is called the Docklands. Leaving this next station, we also see a crazy tight corner, which weaves us around a development and pops us onto the north side of the roadway below. As we turn north, we enter the center of Canary Wharf. Here we have three DLR stations running north-south and the Jubilee and Crossrail stations oriented east-west between and beneath them. This is actually really cool, with the juxtaposition of the docks, the high-rises, and the elevated trains running through it all. You also get a very good view of this from the main Canary Wharf Jubilee line entrance. Leaving Heron Keys and heading into Canary Wharf DLR, I can't help but say this station is epic. You've got a soaring glass canopy that reminds me of a historic rail terminal, three tracks with Spanish solution platforms allowing various services to come and go every few minutes, as well as terminate here, and really nice connections directly into the adjacent transit-oriented development. If it feels like all of these stations are really close together, that's because they are. The back of the train has just barely left Canary Wharf DLR when the front is pulling into West India Quay, the northernmost of the north-south stops here. Heading to the north, we're greeted with another very sharp corner, and sound barriers to the left, which are used sparingly in places where trains might actually make some noise, such as through corners. This type of approach on mitigating sound on an as-needed basis is smart. This is one section where the DLR gets totally crazy. On the right you can see a flyover, which gives the trains from the west, where we are headed, grade separated access to Canary Wharf, allowing a separate set of tracks to bypass Canary Wharf headed to the east at Canning Town. These various grade separated junctions were actually retrofitted in as frequencies increased. Trains originally ran through a giant surface Y, which is part of why West India Quay and Canary Wharf are laid out as they are, and because of the new flyover, West India Quay only serves northbound trains on the service between Bank and Lewisham via Canary Wharf. 
with the old platform being deactivated. Suffice to say, as with many elements of the DLR, this is a great example of changing your transit system to adapt it over time as traffic and demand changes. Leaving West Ferry to the west, we can see a vestige of an earlier time, with these dark blue portals reflecting the original dark blue and red color scheme of the DLR that has changed over time to white and teal. Pulling into Limehouse, we're now running adjacent to National Rail Services, once again on an elevated right of way, this time in an embankment. From here, DLR trains run right next to mainline trains, something which my hometown of Toronto will likely see in the coming years with the Ontario Line subway. The next station, Shadwell, enables connections to the Overground's East London Line. The connection isn't within the station, but it is just across the street. This type of connection is pretty common in London, and especially with the ease of contactless smart cards, seems like a good way to save money on more minor connections. Running along these tracks to the right of us are C to C trains, a service out to the coast east of London that runs into Fenchurch Street Station. C to C also runs adjacent to eastern parts of the Tube's district line. You can really see that this part of the alignment of the DLR is not new, with the old brick wall visible to the side. Approaching the western terminus of the line, we dive into a tunnel, crossing over the tracks into Tower Gateway. Tower Gateway is the simple, original terminus of the system to the west, elevated adjacent to the rail embankment a short walk from the Tower of London and Tower Hill Station on these subsurface lines. The connection to Bank links the system directly to the city centre and the various lines that connect there, and again was retrofitted as demand on the system grew. The tunnels into Bank are fairly boring overall but were really complex to build, and the DLR is very deep at Bank Station, which has a decidedly tube-like look. At this station, there are dedicated arrival and departure platforms, linked with a reversing siding, which is beyond the station. Now, you might think we're done, but not quite yet. During the trip, I also filmed a trip from Canary Wharf to Stratford, so let's take a look at that. As you can see, this DLR service turns around at the central platform at Canary Wharf that we just saw, where we'll be departing from today. You might be a bit confused about how the DLR works. Is it automated or not? So let me give you a quick explainer. Automated trains are measured by something known as Grade of Automation, or GOA. To simplify, a GOA2 system is one which has automatic running from station to station, but with an operator still in the cab. A GOA4 system is one like the Vancouver Skytrain, with no employees needing to be present on the system for it to run. A GOA3 system is relatively uncommon, but the DLR is argued to be one of them. This means an employee is on the train to essentially operate as a guard with the computer systems running the trains. Passing back through West India Quay on a different platform, we can see that previously closed platform is fenced off here to the right. Below us you can also see trains headed from Poplar to the west and from the west into Canary Wharf via the flyunder that forced that removal of the platform at West India Quay just to our right. Leaving the station and going around the corner you can see the old track bed where the surface level wise north tracks used to be. in the platforms for Poplar, we can see the original DLR depot. This one is pretty small compared to the much larger facility out east at Beckton, but also has the iconic deep blue tone of the DLR. Curving north to Stratford, we head through what friend of the channel Paul tells me is the sharpest non-tram curve in the UK, and I can believe it. This definitely wouldn't be doable with a standard non-articulated metro train. If you're wondering why the front of the train is not in line with the track, that's because of outswing, where the bogey and the front of the train become less and less aligned as a corner becomes tighter and tighter, since the body of the train is angled between the various bogies. Arriving into All Saints, we can see that this is an original station given the curved canopies and the blue everywhere. 
you'll also probably notice from the old infrastructure we're passing through that this is yet another old rail corridor. Coming into the next station, we notice hunting, which is really quite bad across the whole DLR network, and much more noticeable in person on a train. So much so that I recorded a separate video of it, not pressing my phone against the window to stabilize it. I discussed hunting in a previous video, but essentially the extremely conical wheels used on the DLR, which allow it to take such sharp corners, are prone to instability on straight tracks. This is why you won't notice the back and forth rocking much, if at all, even in the slightest curves, but on straight sections, the trains often violently sway from side to side. Continuing further along, it's really cool that these old railways have been linked up by an automated train network which enables lots of service along various branches, with a lot of one-seat rides with modern stations and vehicles. You can see departing Bowchurch Station to the north as we turn east, the system goes single track. Fortunately, with an automated system like this, scheduling trains quite precisely isn't an issue. We're actually running single track in part because we parallel another disused rail corridor, which links into the mainline tracks to the east. Seeing all the old infrastructure and tracks completely overgrown next to our frequent metro service feels very London to me. As we leave the single track station, we're passed by a crossrail train. Here we have a passing loop and station at Pudding Mill Lane, which Jeff Marshall has a great tour of you can check out. This is a nice modern elevated station that has the newer teal look, and reminds me of a Skytrain station. It was actually rebuilt to enable space for the crossrail portal, which you can actually see right here. Currently, crossrail trains run around the portal, but eventually it will take them into the tunnels under London. I find it quite funny that this entire station was probably just a minor line item on the crossrail budget. Leaving Pudding Mill Lane, we head into another single track section before pulling into the massive Stratford station, which is a crazy hub that was at one point during the COVID-19 pandemic the most used station in the UK. These DLR platforms aren't even the only ones here, with another set located perpendicular to us running local next to the Jubilee Line extension directly to the south, and connecting to Stratford International to the north. Stratford has service on the overground, two DLR branches, the Central Line, the Jubilee Line, Greater Anglia, Crossrail, and high-speed services from Stratford International. It's quite epic. Stratford was also the site of the Olympic Park and Stadium for the 2012 London Olympic Games, as well as massive amounts of new TOD and a big Westfield Mall between the regular Stratford and its international counterpart. And so that's the story of the DLR for today, I guess. A convenient network of trains linking up loads of major development sites and transportation nodes in London's east, all built in just a few decades and constantly evolving to meet the ever-changing demands of London. I hope you enjoyed this ride along, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.